Thank you, Yusef. Um, Ulf said in his presentation today, whoever talks about Lagos, and I was actually going to talk about Lagos, or at least about Nigeria, because this summer I went to Enugu together with two of my uh, classmates from Karolinska Institute. And Enugu is a quite typical society for this part of Africa. It's very poor, but people seem to be quite happy anyway, like this carpenter guy we met at one of the marketplaces. Enugu was also the site where the Nigerian civil war was fought in the late 1960s. Subsequent to this war, there was an extensive famine affecting the people of this region. The famine of Biafra, I'm sure that some of you remember it. And our intention was to investigate what health effects from the Biafran famine that can be seen in this area today, 40 years later. But in order to do that, we first have to go back to the World War II and uh, Holland, where a famine hit the country in the winter of 1944. A lot of research had been carried out on the people who were born shortly after this ha famine had ended, which is people who were exposed to malnutrition in their fetal life before they were born. And when those grew up to be adults, they turned out to have an increased risk for having hypertension, which is high blood pressure, and prediabetes. And this is important findings in a research field called developmental programming, which links events in early life, for example in fetal life or early infancy, to health outcomes in adulthood. And risk factors for chronic diseases are generally categorized into environmental and innate. Environmental, such as a sedentary lifestyle, diet and smoking, and innate, such as uh, family history, male sex and age. And to these risk factors, we now have to add fetal malnutrition, which is somewhere in between. So let us switch topic and talk about the Nigerian civil war. Nigeria is a former British colony, which ever since its independence in 1960 has been plagued by ethnic and religious tensions between its three main ethnic groups, the Hausa Fulani, the Yoruba, and the Igbos in the southeast. These tensions erupted in 1966, when a large-scale massacre on Igbos living in different parts of the country was initiated, and as a result, the Igbos, led by their charismatic leader, General Ujukwu, declared himself independent as the Republic of Biafra. This was in May 1967. Disapproving of the secession, the Nigerian government sent forces into the region and a war broke out. A war that the Igbos were poorly equipped for the fight. They suffered huge losses against the numerically and technically superior Nigerian forces, but they continued to fight anyway because they thought that Otherwise, they would be entirely wiped out as an ethnic group. Or as the Nigerian Nobel laureate, Wole Soyinka, expressed it, every Igbo man, woman and child believes today that he is fighting a last-ditch battle for his home and his dignity. The federal government is faced with the choice of wiping out the entire Igbo race or administering a nation that has built into its flesh a core of implacable hate there will be no victory for anyone. Biafra rapidly shrank into a small enclave surrounded by Nigerian forces. And it is still a controversial issue whether the Nigerian army used blockade as a military mean. But as the war was fought, food supply into the region was cut off, leading to an enormous scarcity of food, especially proteins, as the staple food cultivated in Biafra were mainly carbon hydrates. And the result was one of the greatest nutritional disasters of modern times, the Biafran famine. Between one and three million people are estimated to have lost their lives in the Biafran crisis, the Nigerian civil war. And 90% of them starved to death and only 10% died of military violence. Millions of people worldwide were moved by the images of the Biafran babies. Fragile skeletons with distended bellies who succumbed to the thousand to this man-made famine. The war came to an end in January 1970 
and relief food could rapidly be sent into the region, alleviating the nutritional emergency. So when going to Nigeria and Enugu, we had a hypothesis. And it was that the Nigerian civil war and the subsequent famine of Biafra had led to an increased number of undernourished pregnant women and thus fetal malnutrition, and that this would result in an increased burden of chronic diseases such as hypertension and diabetes now 40 years later in this region. Before going to Nigeria, we knew very little about the country. Nigeria has a quite bad reputation in Africa, and talking to one old man we happened to meet outside school, Mr. Rosling, was not very encouraging as he thought that at least one of us would come home severely injured. And after saying that, he laughed a little bit, and <laughs> actually then he laughed some more. And arriving in Enugu, the first guy we met was this <laughs> young <laughs> gentleman. That, that was the official uh, hyena sound, according to Google. Uh, and actually, we also found this picture on Google Pics, because we didn't really have to worry, as most of the Nigerians were more like this guy, Mikey. They were happy, cheerful, and they welcomed us with open hearts as we moved into the student hostel uh, at the University of Nigeria in Enugu. There we lived together with the local students and enjoyed playing football with them in the afternoons when we didn't have work to do. We were also lucky to meet this organization, Medics Frontiers. Uh, they helped us out with the field work, which was conducted at the marketplaces of Enugu. So how did, the, how did we gather the data required for this study? First, we, we formed the mobile teams going out on the marketplaces, recruiting shop owners, traders, and customers who were born between 1965 and 1973. In this way, we could get people who were born shortly before the war, during the years of famine, and the period after the famine had ended, and thus exposed to malnutrition at different stages of their lives. And when we found a participant, we first conducted a short interview asking about the family history during the Nigerian war, the place of birth, and also about confounding factors such as education and smoking, which also can affect the risk for chronic diseases. And then we measured the blood pressure. This procedure could sometimes be troublesome as the, many of the shopkeepers were very, very business-minded. So they had some difficulties relaxing while leaving their shop for a few minutes that were required to make this assessment, but it worked out well eventually. And then we measured the plasma glucose, or the blood sugar, which is an indicator for uh, diabetes. And the hardest part here was to convince the participant that we were not going to use the blood sample for any type of uh, voodoo activities. And uh, this was actually a serious concern for many participants. We then measured weight, height, and waist circumference before uh, concluding the session by offering some counseling where we discussed the results and informed about chronic diseases, how to avoid them and how to cope with them. And we also found a few subjects who were severely ill, and those we uh, referred to the University of Nigeria uh, teaching hospital for further investigation and treatment. So our findings. Unfortunately, we have not yet published the article on this project, so I will not be able to give you the real numbers today. I have removed all the p-values and confidence intervals and significance level. And it's, uh, so I'm going to talk about the results without actually mentioning the results, and it's going to be kind of strange and frustrating, especially for me, but I hope that the message can get across anyway. So during our nine weeks of fieldwork, we gathered data from more than 1,300 individuals, born between 65 and 73. And in the analysis, we divided these people into three groups. One group that was born shortly before the famine, and thus exposed to malnutrition in uh, early childhood. And one group that was born during the years of famine, and thus exposed to fetal malnutrition. And then we had a group 
that was born a short period after the famine had ended, and thus those were regarded as unexposed, and they served as a control group. And when taking a look at the su average systolic blood pressure, we could see that those individuals born during the years of famine had a significantly higher average blood pressure compared to the other two groups. And taking a look at the prevalence for hypertension, for high blood pressure, a blood pressure measurement of 140 millimeters mercury or more, we could also see that those who were exposed to fetal malnutrition were of considerably higher risk of having hypertension in adult age. And we also calculated the risk for having a blood pressure measurement in the hypertensive range. And we made this analysis based on birth year. And then we could almost follow the development of the war and the famine we see here in 1966, the massacre on the Igbos is initiated and refugees stream into Biafra which declare itself independent in May 1967. The Nigerian army cuts off the food supply into the region and the nutritional situation deteriorates gradually. The famine peaks between 68 and 69 before Biafra surrenders in 1970 January and relief food can be sent into the region alleviating the nutritional emergency. The economy starts spinning again. The Agriculture recovers before everything goes back to normal levels in 1972. Well, it was almost like uh, uh, the old man we met outside school, but not really. Uh, but looking at this graph, the dose response kind of correlation between fetal malnutrition and risk for hypertension in adult age is striking. And the pattern recurs concerning pre-diabetes and diabetes. Those born during the years of famine were of higher risk uh, of having these metabolic disturbances. And the same holds true uh, for overweight, which is a BMI of, of 25 or above. Those born during the famine uh, were more likely to suffer from overweight. And here I would like to interject that in all three groups, the prevalence of overweight were more than 60%. And this might not be what you expect in a developing country, but these diseases, hypertension, diabetes, and overweight, are very common in many developing countries today, uh, especially in urban areas, and I will talk more about that later. So to summarize our findings, fetal exposure to the Biafran famine was associated with increased blood pressure, an increased risk for having diabetes and overweight in, uh, when in a 40-year-old Nigerian population. These findings are especially interesting and important today, as many developing countries are in the midst of a transition away from infectious diseases and towards chronic, more lifestyle-related diseases, such as cardiovascular diseases and, and, and diabetes as the leading cause of death. For example, in 15 years, 80% of all new diabetes cases will occur in the developing world. And in 20 years, 85% of all cardiovas cardiovascular deaths worldwide will occur in this part of the world. And cardiovascular diseases are already the leading cause of death in many developing countries. Concurrently, we know that between 20 and 40 million babies are born in the developing world yearly with low birth weight. And low birth weight is an uh, indicator for fetal malnutrition. And as our results imply, those babies are born with an increased susceptibility to chronic diseases as they reach adult age. And therefore, there is a concern that developing countries can get stuck in a vicious circle of poverty, leading to undernourished pregnant women and fetal malnutrition, which in turn increases the population's susceptibility to chronic diseases. And these chronic diseases have a negative impact on the economy, leading to more poverty and so on. So, looking at the results from this research, research project, we would like to emphasize the importance of regarding maternal nutrition and healthcare as an investment in the health of the next generation. Thank you. <laughs>